Welcome to Insights at the Edge, produced by Sounds True. My name's Tammy Simon. I'm the founder of Sounds True, and I'd love to take a moment to introduce you to the new Sounds True Foundation. The Sounds True Foundation is dedicated to creating a wiser and kinder world by making transformational education widely available. We want everyone to have access to transformational tools such as mindfulness, emotional awareness, and self-compassion, regardless of financial, social, or physical challenges. The Sounds True Foundation is a nonprofit dedicated to providing these transformational tools to communities in need, including at-risk youth, prisoners, veterans, and those in developing countries. If you'd like to learn more or feel inspired to become a supporter, please visit SoundsTrueFoundation.org. You're listening to Insights at the Edge. Today, my guest is Faith Hunter. Faith is a yoga and meditation teacher with over 20 years of experience. She is the founder, CEO of Embrace Yoga DC, as well as the creator of Embrace Om. Faith is also the architect of Spiritually Fly, a lifestyle philosophy that celebrates every moment of life. And with Sounds True, she's written a new book. It's called Spiritually Fly, Wisdom, Meditations, and Yoga to Elevate Your Soul. In this conversation, we learn more about Faith's challenges in her own upbringing and how she came to really trust herself to find her own what she calls golden glitter through bringing various spiritual practices together into a method that brings forward spiritual flyhood. Take a listen. Here's Faith Hunter. Faith, right at the beginning of your new book, Spiritually Fly, right in the opening dedication You write a dedication, and here it is, to my five-year-old self, I finally see you. And I wanted to know, who is it that you're seeing, and why was it important for you to open your new book, Spiritually Fly, with that dedication? Oh my goodness, Tammy, you you asked the first question, and I'm I'm tearing up right now. You know, it was like at age five was kind of like this tipping point in my life. Um, growing up, I my parents had a housekeeper that that took care of us as little kids. And at age five, I actually went to school full time. And that was that moment where I started to feel these levels of insecurity and inadequacy. And I started to actually go into a cave. Um, prior to that, I was much more vibrant, much more free, much more confident. And right at that age, I um, started this, this spiral. So when you say that you see that five-year-old, why was it important for you to dedicate the book to her? Because I felt like she really wanted to, to shine and had this deep desire to make a mark um, and was lost. And so by me acknowledging her was kind of like grabbing her, hugging her and pulling her along on on this new path that, that I'm in and this new journey and kind of elevating her spirit. Mm-hmm. Now, you write about some of your early biography in Spiritually Fly, and you write about how you grew up as a young black girl in rural Louisiana. And I want to know more and have our listeners know as a way to really get to meet you, what that journey was for you from that five-year-old into over time, you got introduced to yoga and then in a period of more time, you became the spiritually fly teacher. But uh, (laughs) give us a sense of that journey. Yeah, so, whoa, it's it's a pretty rocky, and then it's also a really, really beautiful one. 
I, um, you know, starting from that five-year-old self, I, and that, that young girl growing, growing up in Louisiana exposed, cause I grew up in a college town. And so exposed to people from all over the world, um, actually in our parish in Louisiana, there were two major universities. So this North Louisiana and did a lot of ballet, gymnastics, dance, like all of those piano lessons. Like my mother definitely put me in all the things. And she was actually, I always say that she was living vicariously through me, which is fine. You know, our parents do their best. And then probably like around the age of 10 to 12, um, my ability to fully understand, comprehend and learn efficiently just somehow just didn't match up but everything else made sense. Like if I played the, an instrument, I could actually read music. If, you know, I can listen to timing and know really efficiently, like when I needed to come in as a dancer, like I, and I was really advanced. Um, I was it actually around age 11 or 12, my dance teacher was like, I'm considering putting faith on point. And that was something that really more like 13, 14 year old girls did, but I was so skilled. However, in school, um, it was constant hard work for me. It was a struggle. And then somewhere around high school, um, I started to feel even more incompetent in school. And so, um, I didn't have a lot of friends. I had a very select few. Um, I like to call my friends. We were the, the artsy weird crew and um, <laughs> kind of hung out with them. And then I met a teacher, uh, my math teacher, and she somehow started to make things click technically for me. And I actually came really great at algebra. Like it was like even some of my fellow students were like, what, what is this? Who is this chick? And having that teacher just spill in this this level of confidence in me just kind of helped me kind of like start to see myself a little bit differently in a very educational environment and then from there went on to college um, i still was continued to dance i did um, a lot of people don't know this i did uh, the beauty pageant circuit in louisiana for a really long time odd, but I did it. I did the Miss America system. Um, it was great. It was fun because it was that opportunity for me to, to share my talents and, and my interest. But here's the deal. In between all of that, my brothers were diagnosed in the 80s um, with HIV. And so from like age, I think I was probably like about nine or 10 years old when my brothers were diagnosed. And then throughout my high school, college, years, it was a family secret. And so I think that probably also had a great impact on my ability to, to learn. Um, then when I entered college, I met another person um, that was the director of an HIV AIDS program. And she just inspired me almost like was the first person that inspired me to tell my story. And my story was that this is this thing that happened that was so traumatic to our family. And then all of a sudden, I'm in graduate school and my older brother calls me on the phone because I was in graduate school in New Orleans at Loyola. My older brother calls me on the phone and says, come and pick me up at the airport. And I'm like, what are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I go to pick him up at, at the New Orleans airport. He has no bags. He has a backpack. And he goes, I um, need to go to the hospital right now. And he knew that he was dying. And so over the course of about a year and a half, as he was struggling with his, his HIV AIDS status and his complications related to AIDS, I started practicing yoga. Um, one of my friends said to let's go do yoga and I jumped right in and I always like to share that it gave me a time to move my body in a very different way. So that meant that it was like hitting some other energy centers that I've never hit before. I had these moments of stillness because I was constantly going, I'm in grad school, I'm working, I'm dealing with family. And then the other part of it that I feel like was so crucial is that it gave me an opportunity to cry. And I cried for weeks every time I showed up to that class. And it was this magnificent release. And from that moment, I was like, this thing has to be a part of my life. I don't know how, I don't care where, but I need to be on the mat. I need to breathe. 
I need to meditate. And that's what happened in the late 90s. And since then, it's been not only just something that's carried me through my life, but it's been now it's my career. It's, it's what I do. It is my life. I want to talk more about this diagnosis that both of your brothers received. So uh, you mentioned in Spiritually Fly that there's a history of uh, hemophilia in your family. So uh, how did that happen? And uh, were you nervous for yourself as well the, about your own possibility that you were also a hemophiliac? Yeah, actually, early on, I remember us, um, I was definitely younger than the age of 10. And I was tested, of course, um, for any traits. And so I do have the trait to carry hemophilia. Um, however, I do not have any symptoms related to that. However, when both of my brothers were diagnosed, our entire family was tested. Because if you don't, if you remember in the 80s, Nobody knew. I mean, people thought that you can touch a cup or drink from the same cup or use the same utensils. And so the doctors decided to test the entire family. And of course, that was nerve wracking because we had to wait like almost two to three weeks to get our diagnosis. And then once we were um, once we were identified as being negative, then it was just still this constant scare because my, my brothers still did their their factor infusions at the house. And so there were always needles, there was always blood, like th that was always like in the, our presence in our home. Mm -hmm. Now, I can definitely appreciate you going to your first yoga class and crying and being in yoga classes and crying. I get that you know, the loss of a, of a family member like that and how brutal that is. What started dawning in you where you thought, oh, this is actually a path of empowerment for me. I'm going to become a teacher in something like the way you teach yoga, which we're <laughs> going to get to in just a moment. Yeah, actually it was, oh my God, almost 10 plus maybe more years later after practicing and actually being a student, I ended up leaving a job that I had in DC, which was in the HIV AIDS arena. And I had made a decision that I was burnt out um, because I'd spent years working in that field and decided to move to New York. And when I moved to New York, I was just all over the place taking yoga. I was like, oh my God, I've never seen so many yoga studios and just started just practicing. And then I walked into this place, um, Laughing Lotus Yoga Center, and I was like, oh my God, I am so at home right here. Um, it's extremely diverse, one. It's extremely accepting. The music is insane. I mean, it, they're, they're playing music that like hip hop and, and reggae music and stuff that I listen to at home, and they're doing yoga to it. Right. It's it's not all about the sacred sound, Kurt, right? That we I'm normally hearing in the chants and stuff. I mean, and this is I'm moving in my body in a very different way. I spent probably like eight to ten months practicing there and somewhere um, on the board or you know, out on like the announcement board, it said yoga teacher training. And so I was like, what is that about? Okay, I'm just gonna go to, to the to the info center or info session and see exactly what that's about. Walked into the info se session. Again, the room is filled with so many different types of people from all walks of life. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. I don't know what this is about, but I know for a fact this practice is keeping me whole and I'm constantly sharing it with my friends and family anyway. And so that's what I did. I enrolled in yoga teacher training just off of seeing something that was almost like a, a divine ping. Mm -hmm. And the development of your spiritually fly approach, because it seems like yoga is a part of it and kundalini yoga, you're also bringing in uh, some of what you refer to as your African roots and practices uh, from Africa. You're bringing in a bit of your own upbringing within the Baptist church. I mean, you put a lot into the spiritually fly method. So uh, help our listeners understand that. Yeah, I, I kind of like how you described that. That was like really good. Um, but yeah, it really is this eclectic blend of, I feel what has kept me whole and balanced specifically over the past 10 years. So of course, 
I received my very formal training, um, my yoga teacher training. I did meditation trainings. I did bhakti trainings that were very Vedic in nature. And I've studied Kundalini for a really long time and went through that training. But then I realized that it wasn't fully, my teaching wasn't fully reflecting what I practice at home. What I'm practicing at home are, are the spiritual ancient rituals that are Yoruba in nature. And you know, there are mornings where Sunday mornings when I do need to put on Aretha's gospel state, you know, um, album and, and listen to that. And that drives my yoga practice. So I said, you know what, I have to figure out a way to bring all of this together. And from the time that I started calling my practices spiritually fly, I think that was probably 2007, 2008, sometime around that time to now, they are so drastically different because as I evolve spiritually, as I evolve emotionally as a human being, because I really think that my practices drive the emotional and spiritual or kind of go along the emotional and spiritual lane, my practices that I'm sharing are a pure reflection of what I do at home. So I have my Oshum statue in, at my altar right next to my the Bible that my, my older brother had as a teenager. So it's like, if my life is blending all of that, why not share this with other people? Because maybe somebody's gonna pick up one thing and that's going to support them. Yeah, I want to talk to you a little bit more about that, Faith, because I think sometimes when people get exposed to a specific teaching lineage and they get trained in that, they are nervous that they're going to dilute it or pollute it or create confusion or something like that. So they only bring their you know, singular part of that lineage to their students. And as you said, they've got all these other things they're actually doing, like 80% of the time, and they're only teaching the 20 because they, they're trying to be true to mm -hmm. the person they learned from. So how did you get over that concern that somehow you were like breaking all these boundaries down? Oh, I'm, I'm constantly battling <laughs> the fact that I'm breaking things apart. Um, but at the same time, I think that I found the courage to step out and share what I'm practicing at home. I found that courage from my students because any time that I would say teach a very Hatha or Vinyasa experience and one day I throw in a Kundalini Kriya or a Kundalini meditation at the end, that's what they're like, oh my God, whatever we did at that moment in time supported me. Or if I decide to bring in, a, instead of bringing in a deity story that is um, Vedic in nature, and I, or I link a Vedic philosophy point to a very Yoruba, then what happens is that people start to see the commonalities that we are across culture spiritually. And then again, that's a moment where someone will go, oh my God, I do this kind of undercover thing, you know, with the Orishas, but I'm so glad that you talked about it today because that made me feel so safe in this space for the first time because I normally don't go to yoga class. Like I literally had a student say that. And so hearing those messages from them just empowered me. Mm -hmm. Do you have any uh, guidelines for people in their own uh, spiritual life about how they can, I'll just say it, mix and match and not get confused? Yeah, I think the key is and I think I, I use this all the time, the key that I use are the chakras. That's like my foundation. And it doesn't matter if you are teaching the chakra system or you're, you're engaging in it yourself. If you understand those seven chakras and the aura and you design your spiritual practices and making sure that when you start your rituals, you are grounding, you're rooting down. And then you find, and you can invoke whatever techniques that you want that are gonna support you. Maybe the grounding is just your essential oils, right? And then you move into this much more fluidity action and then you know carry your way all the way up through the chakras. But what is happening is that you're tapping into all seven of those energy centers and using whatever tools. And I think I mentioned that a lot in the book, it's like these practices are the tools. So using whatever tools that are going to enhance your life. Okay, and this phrase, spiritually fly, 
What does it mean? <laughs> so spiritually fly really means stepping out of your comfort zone, designing your spiritual practice in a way that's authentic to you and using whatever tools that are going to support your personal evolution that's going to aid you in any transformation that's going to help you shed any stuff that's keeping you from being your greatest self. And if you're doing that every single day, even if it's like pausing to breathe and, and honor the earth, or you are spending two hours moving through all the things, that's going to give you that spiritually fly life. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to say, Faith, I think you're spiritually fly. And uh, <laughs> having this conversation with you makes me want to just fly right with you. And what I want to know, and believe it or not, I'm going to bring up that five-year-old one more time here. Bring I want to know, how did you transform the, uh, you said she went into her cave. What practices did you find in your life enabled you to create the transformation that gave you the courage? Because you have to have a lot of a sense of inner worth to go out and combine all these things and teach them and be like, well, no one told me I had permission, but I did it. Like, what was your story of transformation yeah. to get to that point? What worked for you? Um, you know what? It also happened around a time where, um, where I started identifying what some of the tools how I can blend some of the tools. And I wasn't doing this in my teaching, but I was doing this in my own personal life. My, my father passed um, in, in 2011. And when he passed, that was the, the time period, um, not 2011, 2001. And that was the time period that I was starting to really dive into the practice of yoga. I wasn't quite a teacher yet, but I was just diving in. But that's when I started really focusing on therapy. And I think going through therapy was my, my first hit of like, I'm doing therapy with a, you know, a, a therapist. And then I'm also practicing yoga at the same time. And I started in that moment starting to feel a little bit more confident. And then from there, as I'm working my way through going, becoming a yoga teacher and moving through my life again, right? I left New York, moved back to DC went through a crazy traumatic relationship that was really toxic and abusive at the same time. And I went into the cave. I went into my cave again. And at that point in time, that cave was about healing faith. And so I was still seeing a therapist. I was doing all the work in terms of like my journaling, my meditation, my breath work, my asana practice. And I realized that, and my mantra, I was chanting like crazy. I think my neighbors thought I was like going crazy because I was <laughs> chanting all the time. I was, yeah, I, I'm like Om Namah Shivaya, just like walking into the elevator. Um, but yeah, so I was like, I'm blending all of those things. And I think that having that spiritual support, because I approached that cave as my sanctuary, as my temple for healing. And when I came out of that, I was like, oh my God, there's something different about what I have to share. Mm -hmm. Now, in the, in the very beginning of Spiritually Fly, you introduce this notion from Vedic philosophy of samskaras, that all of us have these, you could call them karmic tendencies, would be the, the language, I guess that's often traditionally described. And that there is a spiritually fly approach to working with our samskaras such that we can release the unhealthy ones. And I wanted to understand more about that. First of all, a deeper understanding of samskaras, and then how do we each release them? Yeah. So basically, like I'll start with the samskaras and then talk about how that we can like move and shift through them. But we are born with a certain number or layers of samskaras, and those are those imprints um, that are laid onto our soul, onto our being, the moment that our soul drops into that, that physical form, right? Even when we are in, in our mother's womb, those samskaras that are passed down generationally, ancestrally are in us already. Then we come into the world from our experiences and people often say, well, you know, 
I had a really great upbringing at home and like all the things were perfect. And they don't realize that just walking to the grocery store with your mom or, you know, holding her hand while you're pushing the car, your cart, you're absorbing other impressions, right? So you're absorbing these moments of positivity and negativity and they're shaping who you are. But how do we address them? Because if we are giving them from all places, from media, from other adults, right, as children, and then we grow up, we're carrying these the same levels of heaviness, we're adults now, and then we're creating our own samskaras based upon the negative behavior. However, at some point in time, we may go, how do I get better? And the way that we get better is by revisiting that five-year-old self, reconnecting with who that person is, and doing that through the, what I feel is the most powerful, is through the breath work and through the meditation. The asana practice just gets, just gets me going, gets me ready and open to receive that. And then not spiritually bypassing, right? Those, those moments when the anger starts to bubble up or the fear starts to bubble up, Feel, feel it, address it, see it, say hello, be kind to it and compassionate to it. Let it move through the physical body. Allow yourself to cry, allow yourself to scream, and then do the work to reset and repattern the pain and then make a conscious commitment to create new imprints, new samskaras that are going to aid you in living much more fully. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned that you went through a very difficult, uh, toxic relationship passage. And I'm wondering if we could use that as an example, and you could maybe describe the some scars that you think were in you that brought you into a relationship like that, and then how you were able to clear that out. And you talk about when we're creating new patterns, you call them soul prints, that we can bring in these new soul prints. So maybe you could talk about that in terms of relationships. I think that's a, a theme many of us can relate to. Yes. You know. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, I was in a really difficult relationship. I had dated someone for probably like about seven years. We were living together, of course. And in that time, I think what brought me into that relationship was this deep desire um, to be seen and to be heard. And when the relationship started, my my partner at the time, he was was all about like my career and like really supporting me in the practice of yoga. However, the downside to that relationship was that he was extremely controlling. The way that I believe that I made my way into that relationship was the fact that growing up, my mother was very controlling. And so that was something that was very familiar, having someone guide my life. I mean, I, I, it's, I'm gonna tell this story really, really quickly, but as so that everyone also understands just about a week and a half ago, I needed to renew my passport. And I was like, I don't think I've ever renewed a passport. I was like, oh my God, I got my first passport when I was really young. My parents handled it. I got another one when I was in college. My parents handled that when I got another one uh, 10 years ago. And 10 years ago, I was dating this guy and I realized that he renewed my passport. And so I'm like, oh my God, throughout my life, just that simple aspect of having someone else control some of the basic aspects of your life really will impact who you select as a partner because you are looking for, unfortunately, those places of comfort even though they are not healthy. And so the way that I actually kind of work through it is that when him and I broke up, one, I had to like rip myself from the situation because it started to become slightly abusive. And so I had to rip myself away from the situation. Went in, you know, got my own apartment, didn't tell him I was getting an apartment. I mean, I did all those kinds of things, moved into my place. And that's when I went into the cave. And that's when I focused on one of the things that I have in the book. That's when I focused on the love notes. And I think my love notes were one of the major tools that helped me start to, to get it going because I had to write down that I am powerful, I am strong, I am wise, I am smart, I am loving, I am kind. And so seeing those every day, those were 
the positive soul prints. And every, I think I probably had them on my refrigerator for probably about a two or three year period to the point that one of my friend's moms came over. She goes, I think I need to start doing this. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, it was like those simple steps when we recognize that there is something that is holding us in a bad situation, really giving ourselves time to examine our childhood and see if that pattern or that behavior has been reflected or has creeped up in our adult relationships. And if it has, and it's causing you discomfort, it's causing you harm, it's causing you to move into these unhealthy habits, then that's when you need to like pull back, like yank it, like literally yank the Band-Aid off and then start the healing. Let the womb get some air and then you start caring for it. So you, you mentioned this practice of, is it love notes? Is that love, what you- Love notes, yes. Do you still write love notes and put them on your refrigerator? I don't put them on my refrigerator, but sometimes I put them um, by my nightstand. Sometimes I put them in my on my bathroom wall or my bathroom mirror. And I actually, right now, I have a love note statement on my cell phone. So, um, yeah. What is your love note statement oh, on your yeah. cell phone? Yeah. So I'm like pulling it up right now. Love and money, abundance is my birthright. Yeah. So that's the statement right now because sometimes I myself don't feel that I am of value. Um, and the one thing about energetics is that love and money run in the same path. Um, they run in the same energetic lane. And therefore, that is that place of abundance. And so allowing myself to remember that. I deserve the abundance. I deserve the love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, let's say somebody writes a love note to themselves on their phone or on their refrigerator or wherever the heck they put it, and they see it and they go, "Yeah, I don't know. I don't. Only fifty percent of me believes it, but you know, faith suggested I write a love note. I wrote it. I put it there, but okay, I don't. I don't really believe it. Whatever it is." Yeah, it takes time. Trust me. I, I think that's probably why the first set was actually on my refrigerator and all the different places for two years, because it took a long time for me to get it in my body. It becomes a habit. Um, in the in the practice of Kundalini, they recommend that you do 100 and, uh, no, 1,008 days. That's when you actually seal something in. Like, the 40 days is just creating like this tiny little habit. But when you take that 100 or that 1,008 days, you have sealed in a brand new pattern. Like it is what you are going to do. It is who you are. And so you just keep chanting it. You keep repeating it. You keep seeing it. And then at some point in time, it is you. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned that the breathing is such an important part of the yoga practice view, even more than the, the movement, that the, the breathing is so critical. And you write in Spiritually Fly, the breath is my foundation for living authentically. How is the breath your foundation? I think about those moments when I am feeling anxious, um, when I feel like you know, even today when you initial like the first question was about my five-year-old self and I'm like, oh my God, I'm tearing up. And the thing that brings me back to my center, brings me back to my power, brings me back to my, my spiritually fly alignment is recognizing that, feeling that, knowing where it's coming from. And the only way I can do that is by pausing and just breathing deep. And then exhale breathing deep again, right? Giving myself that opportunity to be in the feelings and the sensations. And that's when it's really hard. Yeah. It's easy when I'm having a great day and I'm coming to my mat and I'm, I'm allowing the breath to be in me. That's almost like just adding icing on the cake. But the foundation is the all of those elements and pieces that go into the baking of the cake. 
And that's in those prob in those moments where I am going through a hard time, I am struggling, and then I can identify, even if it's just a tad bit of anxiety or a tad bit of fear, to say, the breath is going to hold you. All right, which one are we going to use today? Is it just long, deep breathing? Do I need to calm down? Do I do need to do left nostril breathing? Because I know for a fact it's going to center me. Mm -hmm. So let's say someone's listening and their challenge is that they get anxious a lot. What would you recommend in terms of how they work with their breathing to help them when they notice that they're anxious? Yeah, I definitely would recommend long, um, long, deep inhales and exhales and giving themselves time to pause. So not only just taking long, deep inhales when they, they're moving frantically or they're feeling this sense of anxiety, but stopping, grounding down through the feet, sitting down for a moment, closing the eyes and taking the deep breath, that's what's going to, to help calm them and soothe them. Um, the other breathing technique that I often recommend is Satali Pranayam. And so that's really great for like cooling. And so you just kind of breathe through your tongue, you inhale, like you're creating a little straw with your mouth and you breathe in and out. And that kind of like cools some of the, the sensations that come in. And so if you're unable to curl your tongue, cause not everyone can do that. You can just kind of like draw the teeth together and kind of sip the air in through the teeth. And so that the tongue still feels this cool sensation. Now, Faith, towards the middle of the book, Spiritually Fly, you offer a chapter called Face Your Demons with Compassion and Bravery. And as I was reading the book, I circled the word demons, and I was like, why does Faith call these challenges we have inside, whatever it might be, why does she call them demons? Yeah. So, you know, one of the reasons that I call them demons, I, I think probably it reminds me of horror flicks mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know those those little demons those little monsters that just like come out and and scare the crap out of you right i'm sitting there and watching them i'm like oh but i keep watching i keep engaging in in the movie um i keep thinking about the demons and what what's their backstory and so i think as I was shaping the book and labeled that the demons, it's like we have these very challenging moments in our lives that we experience. And then we keep reliving them and feeling them kind of like, I can't stop watching that horror flick. However, at some point we realize that it's not the pain and the suffering that we desire anymore what we want is to find this aspect of ease and comfort and we want to be happy. But in order to do that, we have to examine where these demons are coming from, what, what they're made of. Um, why, are there, why are they chasing me so heavily? And then that's kind of how we move through the, the challenging situation. So it's, it's not in a sense of like they're evil, but they're just these scary, frightening aspects of our being. They're, they're part of who we are and we can't run from them. We have to stand up and face them and see them for, for all that they are, because they're gonna teach us lessons. You know? Can you give me a, a specific example, either from your own life or something you've seen as a common demon that yoga students who come to you have to face with compassion and bravery? I think the, the biggest one is fear um, and fear is really associated with shame. And I've, you know, in my own life, there are different aspects about who I am that I was afraid of being. And so I would attach a lot of fear and shame around that. I, um, I'll tell you one of the aspects that I, I had around shame around myself was my laughter. Hmm. Like that's strange. It's very strange. And part of it is like, my laughter is so big and I experienced it, meaning the shame, as a yoga teacher, where I was working for this yoga studio and the yoga owner came to me one day and she goes, 
faith, your students think that you laugh way too loudly and too much. And I was like, I'm taking away my joy here. But in that moment, it made me so self-conscious. And I was like, where do I get this laugh from? Well, I get this laugh from my mom. My mom's laugh is like huge and gigantic and, and loud. And so I had to release the shame around that beautiful expression of life and realize that my way of teaching and sharing is hopefully helping people experience joy and my way of expressing joy. And when something is exciting, that I laugh really loudly. Um, and that took me, that took me a couple of years as a yoga teacher to like, oh my God, I shouldn't laugh in class. Oh my God. And so it created anxiety and fear of like, if I laugh too loud, would people be annoyed by it? Okay. So someone's listening and they have some kind of deep fear, but it has nothing to do with the sound of their laughter. Who knows? Maybe their fear is about, you know, never really doing something useful and helpful and important and noticeable in their life or that they're never going to really have enough money or that they're never mm. going to have the partner they want to have, you know, all kinds of fears that people have. Yes. And what is the spiritually fly way to face your demons and work through it? So the spiritually fly way of, of facing your demons is to, to drop into some really deep breath work. Um, I like to use um, kind of circular breath to help me get there sometimes. I also like to use breath of fire. And anytime I'm engaging those breaths, I allow myself to recall the feeling and the situation that is creating that sense of fear, creating that sense of shame, and just like get in the breath. So again, like the breath of fire is that powerful inhale and exhale through the nose. And I'm just- Can we do it, Faith? Can yeah, you, like, yeah, let's totally. Just, let's just do it. Let's do let's it. Do Take it. people okay. through it. Yeah. Sure. So breath of fire, again, it's a deep inhale and exhale through the nose. It's very powerful and forceful and it's rhythmic. So you're kind of keeping time with it. And it sounds like and feels like you're pumping something really hard. So let's give it a try. So just take a deep inhale first through the nose, exhale out of the nose, and then find your pace and rhythm. So again, it's, you can do this anywhere from like 30 seconds to a minute, three minutes, and it's powerful inhale, exhale through the nose. And then at the end, I'll take a big inhale, I'll hold the breath, kind of retain it, locking it off and just feeling all of that heat and that fire start to come up and then exhale through the nose. And so the thing that is happening specifically with that particular breath, it is that it is purifying and cleansing. So I find that regardless of any fears that are starting to bubble up, that powerful breath helps you start to feel it a little deeper. It comes to the top and the energetics of purifying and burning it off helps you start to release it. And so as you working with it, powerful inhale, powerful exhale, my mind is focusing on that fear, that sensation. Okay, now I'm going to inhale. I'm going to hold. And then you say to yourself, this is no longer part of me. This is no longer serving me. Like whatever words or phrases resonate with you, I am letting it go. <sighs> Release. And then it's not going to work the first time. <laughs> Let's be really honest. So that's when you make a commitment to yourself. You make a commitment, that's the bravery of saying, I'm going to face this thing until it's not triggering me in the same way. It's not pulling me away from my, my alignment in the same way. And I'm gonna make it a consistent practice. And so taking that single breath, attaching it to a fear and consciously working through it over time, it'll start to, to fall off, but you're facing it, right? You're committing to it. That's kind of the compassion aspect of saying, you know what? I'm going to carry myself into this place and I'm going to work on it. And then the commitment is going to drive, drive it home. <laughs> 
So just to clarify, when I'm doing that intense breath of fire, that pumping with the breath, I'm bringing my fear, whatever it might be, right in. I'm inviting it in. I'm being okay. willing to experience it. But then when it's done and I exhale, that's when the release happens. And release I, I, I let it go. I let it go yeah. then. And I'm like, I don't, I don't need you anymore, whatever the words are that, mm -hmm. that come up. Yeah. Okay, that's really helpful. Now, one of the things I loved reading in Spiritually Fly is this notion that as we work through whatever our demons are representing and bringing forward in our life, we come to discover something that you call, I love this, our golden glitter. Our golden <laughs> glitter. Uh, tell me how you came upon that phrase and what is our golden glitter? So, um... I came upon that phrase because, uh, well, one, the word golden. Um, my my grandfather, that's his first name. Um, his first name is Golden. And the glitter part is the part that is always shining and radiating within us. And I do remember as a young girl, my grandfather, he called me sunshine. And so like he saw something really bright in me and he rarely ever called me faith. Um, he always called me sunshine. And as I was writing the book, I was like, how can I fully express what it feels like when you release some of that fear or what it feels like when you feel empowered, what it feels like when you finally feel safe in your physical form, right? Because sometimes our greatest fear is not even feeling comfortable in our own form. And so when we realize that we're shining and we're radiating. But then the residual is that as we're shining and radiating, that's sprinkling into other aspects of our lives. That's actually touching other people. And if you think about glitter, like you sprinkle it and it is not coming off. I mean, I don't know if you've ever had it on your yoga mat, <laughs> but you get some glitter on your yoga mat or, you know, you go somewhere and you try and clothes that have a little glitter on them. You're like, where did that come from? Like it sticks. And so that's what happens is that when you start to radiate and shine, your golden glitter is going to stick and touch so many people, meaning your light, your, your shine, your sunshine is going to touch other people. And that's going to maybe inspire them. That's going to make them feel whole and comfortable. That may make them feel safe. Um, you know, a lot of us work behind the, you know, these computers and looking at screens all day. Sometimes your radiance and your golden glitter shines so powerfully that people can even feel it through a computer screen. Mm -hmm. And part of that is that you're doing that work for yourself. Yeah. So let's say uh, you're having a day and you're like, uh, not a lot of golden glitter happening today. I need to activate my golden glitter for this, for whatever it might be. Maybe it's a a class you're going to lead, or maybe it's just been, you know, or you just want to activate your golden glitter. What I do you do? Activate. One of my favorite ways and probably one of the fastest and easiest ways yeah. to activate is that I turn on my favorite song and I dance like crazy passionately, like whatever the rhythm is. I just like dance like nobody's looking. And I'm like, all right, I'm ready for the day. I'm ready for this meeting. I'm ready to like go out there and give it my all. Now, what if you can't dance? right? Sometimes I, I may be about to teach a class, a yoga class. I'll put on my headphones and I'll listen to that song. And I'll just like, let that energy start to move through me. And so in that thought, one of the easiest ways I find to, to activate your golden glitter is sound current. Um, and so it, permeates our being in such a positive and high vibrational way. For people who are not familiar with that, uh, what does that mean? How do I turn the sound current on or tune into the sound current? Tune into the sound current. Well, the, the, tuning into your own sound current, of course, you can hear right yourself breathing in and out, right? That's the sound. Hearing your own self speak and talk, that's your internal sound current. However, everything in the universe carries its own tune and vibration and sound current. And so if there is a song that you resonate with, think about what in that song makes you feel good. 
Is it the sound of the vocalist voice? Is it the drum beat, right? Is it the rhythms, right? And so whatever is like bringing you that happiness and joy, that means that you're tuning in to a sound current that resonates with your sound current. And then from there, you're creating that magical kind of like cohesive collective sound current. I have a hypothesis that having a, a lot of golden glitter pouring out of you requires a certain amount of passing through courageous tests. First of all, I wonder what you think about that. And then secondly, I'd be curious to know for you, what do you, what do you think in your life has required the most courage? Wow. I, you know, actually, I won. I like that, that theory and that philosophy because if we aren't examining um, all of our challenges and facing them head on, then we're not going to know what's on the other side. Like we need to know the pain sometimes in order to know the, the, the joy and the lightness. But I would probably say the courageous moments in my life were definitely saying that my brothers were HIV positive out loud. Um, and having the the courage to do that, and then taking that moment to step away from a, a toxic, abusive relationship and resetting myself completely all over again. I mean, that took a lot of strength and possibly some of the the deepest courage. Those two moments in my life. Mm -hmm. Now, Faith, in addition to being a yoga teacher and a writer and a person with a terrific laugh and an outrageous <laughs> dancer. You're a business person. I you am. You created the first studio in the DC, Maryland, Virginia area where people of color could be trained by yoga teachers of color. And I'd like to know if you were to summarize for me, these are the principles of being a spiritually fly business person, <laughs> what those might be. Yeah, um, being a spiritually fly business person is, one, having, having the courage to trust yourself and trust your instincts um, and really listening to your intuition. There are constantly going to be, regardless of what industry you're in, there are going to be so many things coming your way as you serve as the leader or, or the head of the organization, or even if it's, it's the leader of your team, right? Trusting your instincts, trusting your intuition. The, the other aspect is listening. I make sure that, yeah, I'm the one guiding the ship or I am creating some of the, the aspects of the business and I'm driving it. However, I have a team. And so I need to always create space to listen to my team so that I understand not only what they want to get across and what they want to share, but in the listening, it's not just listening to what they have to say is also listening through observation because then I can see also what their greatest gifts, greatest talents and skills are. And then that lets me know, you know what, maybe this person doesn't need to, to run this area of the business. Maybe they'll be more inspired on this lane. And then by doing that, I may shift someone and then finally, wow, they're in their glow and glitter moment, right? They're shining bright. The, the other thing is that making sure that as a spiritually fly business owner, that you need to step away and sometimes release the power. Um, it's, all, it's been a struggle for me sometimes to let go of some of the responsibilities, especially when I started out really small and like release the power to others. And I started doing it in small increments by like, when I go on vacation, I don't check my email. Or if I'm going to teach a yoga weekend somewhere, then it's okay to let someone else um, handle all of the, the fires that are happening. And so that takes a lot of bravery and courage to just say, I don't need to handle everything. I just need to be informed, right? And trusting my staff that they are going to do exactly what they need to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, Faith, I'm going to go back for a moment to the way that you've put together Spiritually Fly and brought together so many different elements of practices that are important to you. Because when it comes to 
you drawing on your African roots and African spiritual traditions, I'd love to hear more about a practice that you do, that you integrate, that you could offer people now based on those roots that can be helpful to them on their journey to be, to flyhood. To flyhood. <laughs> so um, actually one of the, the things that I do is more of like a ritual, um, but it does involve coming back to that sound current aspect. And so I mentioned earlier that I am a, true like devotee um of oshum i think i mentioned that earlier you and did. so okay and so oshum um is is my goddess of choice and she holds an altar in my home so the things that i do is i i, I light a candle for her every morning um i burn for, for those of us who who've never oh. met her before we don't know who she is oh, tell, yeah. tell, okay, tell us more tell us more that's right yeah so oshum is the goddess of fresh water um, she is, as you drink your tap water and your fresh water, <laughs> your clear fresh water, um, she's the goddess of fresh water. And what she does is that she, the idea is that you come to her, you create an offering and say, you know what, Oshum, wash away the things that are no longer serving me. And she comes in with this loving, sweetness, kind, devotional energy and supports you in those moments where it is rocky, it is difficult, it is challenging. And so I always tell my students, just leave it in the river. Oshun will, will take care of it. Um, and you can even invoke her in the shower, right? Anywhere there's this, this beautiful wave of water. So in the mornings, I light a candle for her. I burn Palo Santo. And um, when I want to make a pure devotion, meaning like something very specific I may be working on, I will have a yellow candle because yellow is her color. And I'll create a yellow candle, infuse honey um, into maybe an oil um, or any other sweet things. And I'll like cover myself in it, almost like bathe in this oil, honey ritual, light the candle as that's burning. And then I will chant her mantra, um, which I actually include in, in the book. Can we yeah. hear it? Ah, yes. Let's see. Let me get it right. Ite were were ite oshun, ite were were ite ya, ocha naniba ite oshun, cheke cheke nite oshun. Yeah. Gorgeous. That's it. That's it. So it's Gorgeous. just like calling on her and just, um, asking her to, to hold me during these difficult times and to bring in uh, the sweetness back into my life. Yeah. Now, as we close, Faith, I want to just draw our listeners' attention to your book, Spiritually Fly, Wisdom, Meditations, and Yoga, to elevate your soul. And I'd love to know from you, you poured yourself into the writing of this book. Anybody who picks it up and looks <laughs> through it can tell it is a huge creative compendium of so many different approaches, techniques, tips, things you can try. What do you hope will come from the book, Spiritually Fly, this book that you poured yourself into? My hope in writing it and sharing it with the world is that even if it's just one tool somebody picks up and finds and it changes their life and just helps them move in a different direction um, or make a choice that's going to greatly impact the rest of their life, then my purpose is served. I, I really hope that people will walk through the entire book and move through the practices in the way that I kind of laid it out because it does kind of build. And in that, if they're following it, the idea is that when they finish at the end of that 40 day practice, that they've created some amazing soul prints. They have these new layers of samskaras that are going to help them in the most difficult, most challenging moments. And it becomes a natural part of their life so that when something challenging does happen, they're like, oh, let me go grab this out of my, my toolbox, my spiritually fly toolbox. This is gonna help me because it's tried and true. I've tested it on myself. I've done it and I'm, I know it's gonna work. Yeah. 
I can tell you, Faith, that your book is going to release a lot of golden glitter into the world, for sure. <laughs> I've been talking with Faith Hunter with The Beautiful Laugh. She's the author of the new book, Spiritually Fly, Wisdom, Meditations, and Yoga to Elevate Your Soul. Thanks, Faith, and thanks, everyone, for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Insights at the Edge. You can read a full transcript of today's interview at soundstrue.com forward slash podcast. And if you're interested, hit the subscribe button in your podcast app. And also, if you feel inspired, head to iTunes and leave Insights at the Edge a review. I love getting your feedback, being in connection with you, and learning how we can continue to evolve and improve our program. Working together. I believe we can create a kinder and wiser world. Soundstrue.com, waking up the world.